Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. The island continent of Australia is famous for its diverse array of marsupial mammals, including kangaroos, koalas and wombats. This is the result of the country's history of relative isolation from other land masses during the Cenozoic, particularly after Australia split away from Antarctica by the early Eocene. By this time, the ancestor of all the modern endemic marsupial species had arrived, island hopping across the cool temperate south polar region. Having evolved in South America, this putative ancestor was probably quite similar to the extinct genus Jarthia from the early Eocene Mergon fossil site in Queensland, which was a small generalist insectivore or frugivore, somewhat like the modern Monito del Monte of Chile. From these humble beginnings, marsupials exploded in terms of diversity, moving into all kinds of different niches. From arboreal herbivores to mole-like insectivores to relatively large apex predators, Many of these filled similar ecological roles to the placental mammals found on other continents. Although, for whatever reason, terrestrial placentals were unable to make their way into the land down under, we know that these animals were present in early Eocene Antarctica, including the herbivorous notoungulates. Perhaps these were already too large and heavy to survive a rafting event across the ocean. Interestingly, the very fragmentary genus Tingamara, also from the Mergon site, has been tentatively classified as a basal ungulus of some kind. However, it's only known from a single tooth, so that's not exactly much to go on. The oldest known definitive Australian placental mammal was the early bat Australonicteris, once again from Mergon, which demonstrates just how quickly the flying Chiropterans were able to establish a near-global range from their point of origin in the Northern Hemisphere. For much of its Cenozoic history, bats were the only placentals native to Australia, with these aerial mammals still retaining a notable presence there today. There are over 90 species of these flying placentals in the land down under, and are highly diverse, being found across the continent in a wide range of different ecosystems. They include the small agile insectivores of the family Vespertilionidae, the so-called old world leaf-nosed bats of the genus Hipposideros, as well as the large fruit bats of Pteropodidae, often referred to as flying foxes due to their cute, almost canine-like faces. My favourite Aussie Chiropteran, however, is the ghost bat Macroderma gigas. The only member of the false vampire family Megadermatidae native to Australia, this relatively large, pale-coloured bat is an active hunter of vertebrate prey, including small birds such as budgerigars, other bats, rodents, frogs and lizards. Ghost bats are generally sit-and-wait ambush predators, with prey items detected through both echolocation and the animal's strong senses of hearing and vision. Prey may be taken both in the trees or on the ground, with the unfortunate animal being enveloped in the bat's wings and killed with repeated bites to the back of the head. Endemic to coastal regions of northern Australia today, these bats have few natural predators, and have even been seen hunting alongside medium-sized owls near cave mouths. Roosting in large groups, females give birth to a single offspring in the late spring, which will hunt with its mother until it reaches a degree of maturity. The species is classified as vulnerable and is sensitive to human disturbance, as well as to the spread of the cane toad population which the bats will try to eat, but then succumb to the toad's poisonous secretions. However, bats would not be alone forever. Within the last 10 million years or so, Australia drifted northwards and came into closer proximity to Southeast Asia and the Malay archipelago. This led to a degree of faunal interchange, with placental rodents of Asian origin island hopping to the land down under. All of these are members of the very successful family Muridae, which contains the so-called true mice and rats, among many, many other species. Australia today has a large number of endemic rodents, which arrived in two separate waves, with the first taking place in the late Miocene, perhaps as long as 10 million years ago, with the second arriving during the Pleistocene. However, the best place to start our examination of Australian placentals is with a famous relative newcomer to the continent, the iconic dingo. <laughs> Foolish dingo, you must find and devour the seven crystal babies, or spend eternity trapped in deep didgeridoo! <laughs> I am so scared. This distinctive canine is a medium-sized predator of disputed taxonomic status. It has historically been considered a form of domestic dog, not warranting recognition as a subspecies. Although recent studies propose that dingoes more likely represent either a subspecies of dog or wolf, 
or are a full unique species in its own right. With a lean build well adapted for speed, agility and stamina, dingoes represent an early offshoot of the domestic dog lineage that originated in what is now southern China during the early Holocene roughly 9,900 years ago. This lineage, identified by their possession of the haplogroup A1b, then spread throughout maritime Southeast Asia and the Malay archipelago alongside humans. It has recently been identified that the New Guinea Highland wild dog is the most basal living member of this lineage, which may represent something like the common ancestor of the dingo and its close relative, the New Guinea singing dog. The latter is similar in appearance to the dingo and is native to the highlands of New Guinea, where it hunts small game such as wallabies, rodents and birds, while also feeding on fallen fruit. They are renowned for their distinctive and melodious howl, with these dogs generally being considered to be barkless. They are able to be kept domestically, with their trainability and temperament said to be similar to the Shiba Inu and Akita breeds. Genetic testing has found the ancestors of this animal split from those of the dingo roughly 8,300 years ago. This is the date when it is thought that the first dingoes arrived on the Australian mainland. However, the human population which brought them there remains unknown. The oldest physical remains of the animal hail from the Mandura Caves on the Nullarbor Plain in Western Australia, and have been dated to between roughly 3,300 and 3,000 years ago. The discrepancy in dates here may just be down to the fragmentary nature of the fossil record. The dingo's genome indicates that it was once a domestic dog, which commenced a process of feralization since its arrival 8,300 years ago, with the new harsh Australian environment leading to changes in the genomic regions which regulate metabolism, neurodevelopment and reproduction. Modern representatives of this canine can be divided into two broad groups, with one native to western regions of the continent, while the other can be found on the eastern side. It was once thought that this separation was due to the construction of the Dingo Fence, a nearly 3,500 mile barrier built in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The fence, meant to keep dingoes away from grazing livestock, divides Australia into two large sections, a southeast area and a northwest area, which correspond with the two populations of dingoes. However, new findings have indicated that these genetic distinctions go back much further than this suggesting that these canines may have spread across the continent in two separate waves thousands of years ago. Dingoes are absent from the island of Tasmania, as well as parts of southwestern and southeastern Australia. Despite their ancient domestic origins, these animals have developed into naturalised members of the continent's faunal communities, despite originally being a species introduced by humans. This is unlike the rabbits, red foxes and feral cats that plague the country's endemic wildlife which represent invasive species that were brought to Australia far more recently, within the last 200 years or so, alongside British colonists. The dingo's relationship with indigenous Australians is one of commensalism, in which two organisms live in close association, but do not depend on each other for survival. They thus form a notable part of the spiritual worldviews of many indigenous groups, with the canines often hunting and sleeping alongside their human neighbours. Therefore, unlike other truly wild members of the genus Canis, dingoes are able to respond to human facial expressions in a way that wolves and coyotes cannot. In terms of its anatomy, these animals possess relatively large skulls in comparison to domestic dogs, while also having longer muzzles, longer carnassial teeth, larger canines, and a more pronounced sagittal crest, all adaptations for active hunting. Dingoes are also able to rotate their wrists, which makes them quite capable climbers. Average sized adult males stand about 59 centimeters or 23 inches tall and weigh 15.8 kilograms or 35 pounds, with females being slightly smaller and lighter. Compared to the wolf, the dingo possesses a pedomorphic cranium similar to domestic dogs. However, the dingo has a larger brain size compared to dogs of the same body weight being more comparable with grey wolves in this respect. The ears are erect and triangular in shape, while the coat colour ranges from sandy ginger to black and tan to cream. Able to thrive in a wide array of different ecosystems, from harsh desert to tropical forests, dingoes take a similarly diverse range of prey, the proportion and amount of which varies depending on where in Australia these dogs live. Common targets include red kangaroos, agile wallabies, the magpie goose, wombats, as well as introduced rabbits, sheep and cattle. 
Adult dingoes often live in mated pairs along with their offspring from the current year. Although their social structures are quite flexible, across most of Australia, these animals are generally crepuscular, being most active around dawn and dusk to avoid the highest temperatures during the day. Packs will chase after prey as a group, communicating with a variety of barks, howls and whimpers. Able to run at up to 60 km an hour and possessing great stamina, dingoes sometimes employ relay tactics similar to African painted dogs. Running prey to exhaustion before biting the neck to deliver a kill. It's often been suggested that the proposed arrival of the dingo circa 3,500 years ago led to the extinction of the thylacine on the Australian mainland, with the canine essentially outcompeting the superficially dog-like striped marsupial. However, this has been questioned in more recent years, with the two species found to have relatively little overlap in terms of lifestyle and niche with the thylacine being a more solitary animal that targeted relatively small prey, living more like a jackal than the wolf or coyote-like dingo. Additionally, if the recent genetic tests are anything to go by, dingoes first arrived in Australia over 8,000 years ago, which would mean that they lived alongside mainland thylacines for a pretty long time before the marsupial's extinction circa 3,000 years ago. Other factors that led to this extinction for thylacinus may have included intense human population growth, technological advances, and the abrupt change in climate that occurred at this time. Often villainised by farmers, it's been found that dingoes play an important role as keystone apex predators in Australia, helping to manage numbers of invasive species such as deer, rabbits, buffalo and red foxes. In lower positions on the food chain, but no less important, are the many endemic rodents native to the continent. At the time of European arrival, there were over 60 species of these placental mammals, all of which were members of the highly diverse and successful family Muridae, which originated in Asia during the early Miocene. The first of these animals to reach Australia were the Hydromyini clade, within the subfamily Murinae. These represent one of the more basal groups of murine rodents, spitting off roughly 10 million years ago in Southeast Asia, and later spreading first into what is now New Guinea, and then successfully colonising mainland Australia by around 2 to 3 million years ago, where they underwent a massive diversification event. Although the name of this clade derives from the genus Hydromus, meaning water mouse, only a few species are semi-aquatic, with the vast majority being terrestrial. The Australian members of this clade are often referred to as the old endemic rodents to differentiate them from the later arriving members of the genus Rattus, which are also endemic to the continent. The Australian Hydromyini species inhabit a very wide range of niches, from tiny hopping jerboa-like forms to relatively large semi-aquatic carnivores that are superficially otter-like. As there are so many different species, I'll only be covering some of my personal favourites here. A good place to start would be with the Rakali, or Australian water rat, a member of the genus Hydromus, which gives the whole clade its name. There are four species within Hydromus, with three of these being endemic to the island of Papua, while H. chrysogaster is found both here and on the Australian mainland, present across much of northern and eastern parts of the country, including Tasmania. The Rakali is a semi-aquatic nocturnal animal that lives in burrows on the banks of rivers, lakes and estuaries, and feeds on insects, fish, snails, frogs and small water birds. Measuring up to 70 centimetres or about 30 inches long, it's quite large by rodent standards. With a streamlined hydrodynamic body, long tail, waterproof fur and pointed snout, they are generally dark brown with a ginger to white underside, while the tail has a distinctive white tip. Interestingly, the Rakali is one of few Aussie endemics that are capable of preying on the introduced cane toad, with the rodent flipping the toads onto their backs and feeding on their livers and hearts, apparently being immune to the toxins produced by the invasive amphibians. It's thought that competition with the Rakali may have led the ancestors of the modern platypus to lose its teeth when reaching adulthood, with the monotreme specialising towards feeding on the riverbed rather than in the water column. While the Rakali has a wide range, other members of Hydromyini have been hit hard by human expansion in Australia, such as the rabbit rats of the Conilurus division. Despite the name, most species are at least somewhat arboreal. These are quite cute, relatively large rodents with long fluffy tails, 
three species of which have gone extinct since the European colonization of the continent. Some genera, on the other hand, are very small and fill niches similar to those of the so-called true mice found in Eurasia and Africa. These include the highly species-rich genus Pseudomus, which are found across the entirety of the country. Often referred to as the Australian native mice, there are 23 species of these, all of which are small and fairly generalised in terms of niche, although they tend to be well adapted to the harsh, dry conditions of the Australian interior. Pseudomus species are omnivores, feeding on insects, seeds, fruit and leaves. These are fairly close relatives of the Australian hopping mice, the genus Notomus, which, as their name suggests, are specialised bounders with strong hind legs and highly elongated tails, showing a high degree of convergence with the jaboas found in North Africa and Asia. The five living species are found in dry, arid to semi-arid regions, and tend to be a light brown fawn colour. They live alongside the similarly adapted small marsupial dasurid, the kultar, although this animal is a dedicated insectivore instead. Other forms, such as the banana rats of the genus Melomus, inhabit the wet coastal forests of northern and eastern Australia, being mostly arboreal. Some species of the closely related genus Uromus are among the continent's largest rodents, such as the giant white-tailed rat, which can weigh up to one kilogram. This greyish tree-climbing animal is native to the tropical forests of northern Queensland and possesses a broad omnivorous diet, feeding on fruit, seeds, insects, small reptiles and bird eggs. Many of these hydromyene species have been hit very hard by the British colonisation of Australia, with formerly healthy genetically diverse populations being highly reduced due to intensive farming practices and the introduction of new predators such as cats and foxes. Unfortunately, this is a common theme when examining Australia's native wildlife. There are also the seven species of the so-called new endemic rodents, all of which are members of the genus Rattus. These tend to be smaller than the famous brown rat, which has become a major pest in Australia and possess generally herbivorous diets. So to conclude then, while endemic placental mammals in the land down under are represented by just three major groups, chiropterans, rodents and canids in the form of the dingo, these all play important roles in the broader ecosystem, with dingoes being keystone apex predators, while bats and rodents have produced dozens of highly diverse species that thrive alongside their marsupial neighbours. For this they deserve to be better known outside Australia. Thanks for watching everyone, the next episode will be covering the Glyptodonts, those massive extinct herbivorous armadillos of Cenozoic South America. So until then, I'll see you again soon. Cheerio. And I shall rule the down under this. <laughs>